neither the El Paso Medical Society, its members, nor PBS El Paso shall be responsible for the views, opinions, or facts expressed by the panelists on this television program. Please consult your doctor. Thyroid, and how can something so small be so important to how we feel every single day? Eventually, between 30 and 50 percent of the population will have some manifestation of thyroid dysfunction. What does that mean? We'll find out tonight. It may be something that requires medication or therapy or surgery or nothing at all. We'll find that out too. As you know, this is a live show. So call in with some of your questions. We have a live person here to answer the phone call. It's 881-0013. Also, PBS El Paso streams live on Facebook and Instagram. If you go to those pages on PBS El Paso and you go to the El Paso position, you will be able to ask your questions on either one of those platforms as well. So that's always nice as well. This evening's program is underwritten by Southwest ENT Consultants. Also, Dr. William, uh, Wilbur, I always do the Will, uh, Dr. Wilbur J. Strader with Country Club Medical Center, and also Dr. Tamis Bright. And we want to say thank you to the Texas Tech Paula Foster School of Medicine for providing the medical students that man our phones and also to the El Paso County Medical Society for bringing you this show for a whopping 25 years. This year we're celebrating our 25th anniversary of doing the El Paso position. So thank you so much the El Paso County Medical Society. Good evening, I'm Katherine Berg and you're watching the El Paso position. It's interesting because I'll have some of these doctors on the show, and yeah, they're doctors, but I've known them for 20 years. We've been doing the show for 20 years. You know, he talks about farts, and he talks about diarrhea, and he talks about all kinds of things that nobody wants to talk about. And that's what's great about the show, because you get to hear those things on the show and go, I'm not the only one. It's great. See El Paso Physician. Hello, I think that we're back live again. We are having some technical difficulties. Again, I'm Katherine Berg, and we are here this evening. Endocrinology and thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, that is our topic for this evening. And with us, I've got three doctors that I kind of know personally in different ways and in forms of our lifetime. But we have uh, Dr. Wilbur Strader with us, also Dr. Tamis Bright and Dr. Kevin Bright. And Dr. Kevin Bright, I'm going to start with you. You are our, and I love this, you are our otolaryngologist. And I know it's just ENT. You said, oh, it's just ENT, but otolaryngologist, that's kind of a fun thing. Um, I would love for you to tell the audience what that discipline is, um, and then why do, you know, we were talking about Dr. Spears' dad was an otolaryngologist. Why do we not hear that word very often, and why is it just into the ENT world? So uh, Odo Ear, laryngologist uh, voice, uh, our specialty is largely the senses. Um, we uh, take care of the ears, the nose, the throat. Uh, we're an unusual discipline in the sense that we take care of birth or prenatal to death as opposed to being just pediatric or adults. Um, the, uh, the specialty uh, covers sinus disease, it covers uh, hearing, it covers uh, um, multiple different cancers, skin cancers, thyroid cancers, throat cancers. Uh, um, so a, a broad, broad spectrum of things, uh, pretty much everything above the collarbones except for the brain and the eyes. They have their own specialties now. Um, so uh, the reason I'm sitting here tonight is because um, in the spectrum of head and neck cancer, a mm -hmm. frequent head and neck cancer is thyroid cancer. And then there's also benign diseases of the thyroid that sometimes need surgical intervention. And uh, both otolaryngologists and general surgeons uh, are involved in the surgical treatment of those diseases. And thyroid issues are, we were saying in the opening, 30 to 50 percent of the population. I'm one of them. We'll talk about that as the time goes by. Um, endocrinologists, I've always loved that name too. So Dr. Tamis Bright, if you can explain what you do all day, every day, what is an endocrinologist? I know Dr. Strader um, is also an endocrinologist, but how, how would you explain that discipline to our audience? Well, I'm chief of endocrine at Texas Tech, so I am a little different than many because I teach medical students and residents for most of my day, but we have clinic and we also see patients in the hospital that have endocrine diseases. 
And obviously we're talking about thyroid disease today, but endocrine covers any organ that makes hormones. So we not only do the thyroid, we do the parathyroids, which control calcium. Mixed in with that is metabolic disease. So we do osteoporosis and other bone diseases. Mm -hmm. Then the biggest one here that we see, of course, is diabetes. So we have, unfortunately, a large fraction of our uh, population here with diabetes. We also do adrenal disease. Uh, sometimes we'll do uh, GYN things with postmenopausal, hormone replacement, uh, testicular dysfunction. So any type of a hormone problem we deal with. Okay. And that just anything that has to do with hormones, glands, all that good stuff. Dr. Strader, um, I hope she didn't steal your thunder, but I know you got some other stuff up your sleeve as well. So Dr. Strader, Mr. Endocrinologist, all day, every day. I know Dr. Bright kind of took that from you, but it's your turn. Okay, I do exactly <laughs> what Tavis does, uh, except I don't teach too many medical students, although we'd love to. Mm. Uh, teaching is doctoring. Uh, I don't do much different than Tamas does at all. Uh, I've done it for a long, long time, and Tamas probably does it better than I do. Oh, how so nice So it's you. something that uh, you Fix don't too, necessarily Mattis. learn. Um, and if I could, mm -hmm. maybe put in a plug here for one some, someone that's not with us. That's namely uh, Dr. Richard McCullough. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he's been a firm supporter of the El Paso physician. He was born a son of a physician in Australia. His father became one of the first dermatologists in Australia, as a matter of fact. And Richard attended uh, medical school in Queensland, graduated in 1968. Mm. And uh, from there uh, came to the United States at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, where he uh, was at Barnes Hospital and did his internal medicine residency. After that, he returned to the West Coast in uh, Los Angeles and specialized in gastroenterology. And from there, he's just risen into the heavens, so to speak. He, that uh, sounds like he's dead. Be careful how you say that. I meant in glory. Okay, there you go. All right, good. <laughs> he uh, was at UCLA for a while and then uh, moved to uh, Yale out on the East Coast. Uh, he was there for several years, then uh, went to the University of Virginia where he stayed for about 10 years. He became not only an excellent gastroenterologist, but also became a history uh, professor in uh, fact, and uh, still speaks a lot about early American history, the founding fathers, particularly Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was a professor of medicine at the Kansas Medical Center. And then finally in 2009, Texas Tech grabbed him and he came to our city, El Paso. He was the founding chairman of medicine at the Paul Foster Medical School and now centers most of his work in research and in the gastroenterology department at uh, Texas Tech. Uh, Richards had over 400 pub publications and probably 40,000 lectures and uh, symposia. He uh, has done extraordinary research with uh, gastric and GI motility and as a matter of fact, has three or four patents out there for uh, gastric and uh, GI stimulators, which help gastroparesis and lazy bowel syndrome and things of this sort. Nice. He's and continuing his research and has many NIH grants. And uh, might mention now too, he's finishing his term as president of the El Paso Medical Society. He uh, is very sorry he's not here today, I'm sure because this is sort of his swan song for the year. And as I think you mentioned, uh, Jeff Spears taking over the presidency next week. Right, so February 2nd is when, when all that's going down. And, and Dr. Uh, McCollum, thank you very much for all your support that you've given to uh, this program over the years as well. I uh, thank you very much, Dr. Strader. And what I'd like to do is kind of dive right into thyroid disease. And uh, Dr. Bright, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start on your end. I know that you're, front of the panel here, you're the surgeon. So if there's anyone that has any surgery questions, it would be Dr. Bright that those questions would be going to. But in general, thyroid disease, and if I'm directing this to the wrong person, let me know. Describe what thyroid disease is. Um, it, it encompasses so many things, and I don't know if we were able to get a graphic, um, but we, there was a graphic I tried to send in earlier today. If we're able to put that up, that'd be great. Um, but describe, 
what thyroid disease is and how common is it? Well, I think that you do have the wrong person. I think we should definitely go to give Tannis? that to either right, of these Dr. guys. Go to the other Dr. Bright. Dr. Bright. Dr. Bright and Dr. Bright. We'll, we'll come back to thyroid disease. So she's Dr. Brighter. We'll just yeah, do it right. that way. Yes, yeah. we'll go to Dr. Brighter. So you have multiple different thyroid disease because we look at not only uh, the thyroid function, so your gland can be the overactive or underactive. Mm -hmm. So overactive is hyper, like hyperactive, so hyperthyroidism. Or it's underactive, hypo with an O, so hypothyroidism is an underactive gland. And both of those need different types of medication. You can have just a simple goiter where the thyroid is bigger than it should be. You can have thyroid nodules, which can be benign, or they can be thyroid cancer. Or you can uh, have cysts in the thyroid. Um, and you know, sometimes we see patients that have self-limited diseases that uh, are viral infections of the gland as well. Mm -hmm. And then, as we were talking about earlier, there's pregnancy-associated uh, right. thyroid disease too. Exactly. So it, when we're talking about the commonality of it, um, I know, again, we talked between 30 and 50 percent, and Dr. Strader, I'm going to go to you when we talk about the ages. So when I was reading through the information that you sent on, I think to myself throughout the ages, and this is pre-birth into going forward. So if you don't mind, let's start with pregnancy and people who are diagnosed or something's, something's funny with the thyroid in pregnancy, and this is how I was diagnosed. Uh, when I was pregnant with my daughter, maybe four months into it, they thought, we need to test your thyroid. And so let's talk about women who are pregnant that have, when I say something funny, let's talk about symptoms because there are all kinds of symptoms that could be, oh, it has to be something else. Or maybe it's this. Maybe I'm just tired. Maybe I'm just cold. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And talk about that with a pregnant woman. Okay. Okay. Uh, pregnancy, of course, is where thyroid disease usually starts mm -hmm. if you're the kid, at least. Uh, but every pregnant lady should be checked for thyroid problems. Uh, we have what we call uh, subclinical hyper and hypothyroidism. That uh, means you have thyroid disease and don't know it. Uh, the symptoms of thyroid disease are the symptoms of overwork, symptoms of our society. Uh, many of the symptoms of pregnancy are aggravated by thyroid disease. Uh, hypothyroidism in pregnancy is uh, not uncommon and is usually discerned by the uh, obstetrician uh, in the first few months of pregnancy. And let me reiterate too, those people that don't get to do this all day every day, hypo means not enough, hyper means too much. The reason I say that, I was hypo and they thought I was hyper until all the tests came back. So hypothyroidism in pregnancy is relatively common. And uh, if you do have hypothyroidism, which means usually that the uh, tropic hormone, the TSH, mm -hmm. the brain hormone, is high because it's trying to induce the thyroid to produce more hormone for the pregnancy, uh, or, or it, and the uh, thyroid hormones themselves are usually low normal or abnormally low. Uh, this can be due uh, to a problem with the thyroid. It also happens normally in pregnancy that more thyroid hormone is necessary and the, the amount of thyroid hormone may increase 25 or 50 percent even during a, a normal pregnancy. In a, a pregnancy where the patient is primarily hypothyroid, that is the thyroid doesn't work right, mm -hmm. uh, this can be a catastrophe for the uh, infant because thyroid hormone is very critical in fetal development. And in that regard, as soon as the baby's born, uh, in the old days when women stayed in the hospital for a week or two, they'd uh, get thyroid tests after a week and see if the baby maybe had thyroid disease of its own. Mm, mm -hmm. Mother may have been hypothyroid, but baby may be fine. Nowadays, the baby goes home in two or three days, and it's very important that the first neonatal visit, which is usually 10 to days to two weeks, mm -hmm. be kept with the neonatologist or pediatrician and that the thyroid of the baby be checked because congenital primary hypothyroidism is a catastrophe. Right, exactly. And so we, we did have a graphic up a little while ago of just describing what the thyroid looked like in the body and, and just that butterfly shape right around the larynx. Um, question uh, from the audience, if, if 
hypothyroidism during pregnancy, is that something that can go away after pregnancy? Is it something that pregnancy not causes, but maybe uh, helps bring to light and then recedes? There's a 25% uh, wording that you had in there. Is that something that after the woman gives birth, is she always going to be a person that has hypothyroidism? Is it something it's, that recedes? How does that usually work? It's like most uh, metabolic diseases. If you have it under stress, chances are that you're very prone to develop it thereafter. Okay. But in answer to the question, frequently the uh, signs and the lab tests that are diagnostic of hypothyroidism do disappear when uh, the mother delivers. Mm -hmm. However, uh, most of us, I think, feel that she is still at greater risk than the normal population. Tamis, I think you'd agree with that. Yes, and needs to be followed up later on. So if uh, it does go away once she delivers, it does need to be checked probably again in six months and then yearly thereafter because okay. eventually we'll probably come back. Most hypothyroidism is an autoimmune disease, meaning mm -hmm. that you make antibodies to the thyroid and then it destroys the thyroid tissue. So uh, depending upon the antibodies, it may completely go away and now you're, the, the antibodies are gone and they didn't destroy the gland during pregnancy. You can have normal function, but if you have aggressive antibodies, then that function will go down and down and the patient will need thyroid hormone for life then. Okay, and actually that was a, a good question there. So what I'd like to do is ask uh, right after this question is when you start testing the babies, and Dr. Strader was saying within a week or two. Like you said, there was babies go home within a day, I think 24 hours, 48 hours, if that. So Dr. Brighter, um, Dr. and Mrs. Bright, um, when babies are tested, is there treatment immediately when someone, when the baby's a week or two weeks old? How, how does treatment then occur with little tiny babies? So first of all, I'm an adult endocrinologist, so I don't do the little babies. Uh, we ask the pediatric endocrinologist. But the, uh, the answer to that is if, if anyone is hypothyroid, you treat them. So if the patient, uh, whether it's a baby or it's an adult, is hypothyroid, then we give them thyroid hormone. Uh, it comes in as, as a liquid. Mm -hmm. So most adults take tablets, but mm -hmm. as, uh, as a baby, you have a liquid. You can put it in the formula and just give it to the, the child when they're feeding them. And it's, it's a tiny amount, so it's not difficult to do. And then you have to monitor the levels. And thyroid hormone is weight-based. So mm -hmm. as the, the child grows, or if you have an adult that gains weight or loses weight, then that dose usually has to change. And is this, at this point, it, and the testing will occur every couple of months? Is it something that might be a lifetime thing? In general, how does that work out with brand new ones? So if you have a new hypothyroid patient, and I'm talking adults since mm -hmm. I don't do the, the pediatric patients, the, uh, the half-life of thyroid hormone is very long. So in order to get a patient to a steady level of thyroid hormone, it takes about six weeks. Okay. So we start a patient on a dose, you wait six weeks, and then you recheck the thyroid levels again. And when we're checking thyroid levels, as Dr. Strader said, we check two things. You check the TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which is coming from the pituitary gland in the brain. Now that's not the thyroid hormone, that's the stimulating hormone. Mm -hmm. So that's telling the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. And then we usually check what's called free T4, which is the actual hormone that the thyroid is making. It also makes something called T3, and we check a free T3 level as well occasionally. But okay. usually we're, we're monitoring both TSH and T4 to make sure that they're both in the normal range. Okay. So let's take this up now to adolescence. Now we've got the baby sort of covered, and then adolescence here, there's uh, thyroid, you were talking about goiters earlier, and this may be where Dr. Bright comes in too. When is it a situation, and I'm assuming that's where hyperthyroidism comes in, or goiters, when, when is it an issue where people think, oh, I, sh I should get tested? And this is the, the hard thing. There are so many symptoms that could be related to something else. And Dr. Bright, I'll start with you, Dr. Strader, if you want to jump in on how that works. What are some of the symptoms that adolescents can look for? And then we're going we're gonna to get older with this process of questions in a moment. So adolescence growth. So if they, at, at any age of a child, if they're falling off their growth curves and they're not growing at an appropriate rate, uh, also if you have someone that's gaining excessive amounts of weight, whether they're adults or children, uh, you need to be thinking about it at least. 
Um, if you get to puberty and the, the girls particularly, if the menstrual cycles are you know, initially okay and then suddenly they're too short, they're too long, they stop, those are things that can possibly be happening different in, in the adolescence. Um, but the, the symptoms of hypothyroidism are, are pretty much across the board no matter how old you are. Okay. And you get cold, you get constipated, you get kind of puffy, your skin gets dry, which is a little hard in the desert because we all have dry skin, <laughs> um, and you get tired. Yeah. But the problem is, as you said, okay, so I'm cold, constipated, and tired. Now what? Is that really your thyroid? Right. So right. It, it is very difficult to know if that really was thyroid symptoms or whether you really just needed less stress and more sleep. And we're gonna get back to that in a little while too. So I, I'm gonna include Dr. Bright now too in nodules. So if there, and I'm looking at adolescents again, if there are nodules present in an adolescent who now is at the doctor, and maybe this is just part of a normal physical that they go through, let's talk about thyroid disease and nodules being present. And, and just in general, what, what would you do as an ENT? So in a day in day out basis, um, we're examining patients. Our head and neck examination includes the ears, the nose, and feeling the neck and the thyroid gland. And mm -hmm. Um, periodically, you find uh, nodules de novo. Um, frankly, the vast majority of the nodules that I see are diagnosed by someone else, and uh, they arrive on my doorstep with a, a full workup and diagnosis and a, a request for surgical intervention. Okay. Um, but conceptually, um, small nodules, big nodules, and nodules being either cancerous or benign, um, so uh, the primary focus on the differential diagnosis, figuring out what's going on is, is this a cancer or is this a non-cancerous tumor? And uh, does it need to be removed? Mm -hmm. Lots of non-cancerous tumors can be watched and surveyed, um, serial tests, ultrasounds, and maybe they're not growing and nothing needs to be done. Other larger ones uh, may have symptoms like airway obstruction, difficulty swallowing, just the appearance of a, a large uh, disfiguring goiter, uh, mm -hmm. even if they're not cancer, some of those may be surgical. And if you can describe a biopsy, if you, if you could, um, if, if there is a point where you think, well, you know, some of the tests are showing that there is an issue and there's a biopsy, is that, okay, hold on, I've been, Tamis is doing this. So that goes to Dr. Strader over here. So Dr. Strader, if we can talk about a thyroid biopsy, if we can explain how that is done. Well, a thyroid biopsy is, is done uh, for a suspicious looking nodule. Mm -hmm. And a suspicious looking nodule is usually ascertained by an ultrasound or sometimes clinically by a, a large mass that just suddenly appears and becomes larger and larger and larger. Uh, so once we have established that the nodule in question needs to be diagnosed histologically, a biopsy is done by numbing the neck, mm -hmm. uh, sticking a small needle into the nodule, usually mm -hmm. under ultrasound guidance, and aspirating some of the tissue within the nodule. This then is spread on a, on a uh, glass plate and mm -hmm. the pathologist looks at it and tells us whether or not it's a thyroid cancer or whether it's a, a reactive type of thyroiditis, for okay. example. And pardon my ignorance here because I'm kind of new to the world of thyroid cancers. Is there staging? Is there, are there different types of thyroid cancers? I'm thinking breast cancers. I'm taking prostate uh, cancers. Um, and, and who is it that I would ask that question of? Would that be Dr. Strader, Dr. Probably Bright? Less. Okay. No. They're, they're Several types of thyroid mm -hmm. cancer. Uh, I think we might want to back up a little bit here okay. first and just talk about nodules in the, okay. themselves. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, because uh, the adolescent, for example, often comes in with a big thyroid because adolescents are growing and the thyroid grows too. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's lumpy and bumpy because there's a propensity of that family, for example, to develop thyroiditis and we feel what we call bosselations or lumps and bumps. And uh, then the patient usually ends up getting an ultrasound. And if there's a nodule there uh, and it looks suspicious, it's biopsied. And if it is a cancer, uh, it most 
commonly is what we call a differentiated thyroid cancer, which is papillary or uh, follicular. Uh, and these cancers are treated usually with surgery and then uh, a bit of often radioiodine ablation and, okay. of course, uh, very active surveillance thereafter because cancers, if you have one, you're likely to have two. The most, if you have a thyroid cancer, particularly as a young person, uh, most of us think that it's probably best to take the whole thyroid gland mm -hmm. because, uh, like breast cancer, it's going to remain a threat throughout life. Uh, there are two or three other cancers. Uh, one of them is anaplastic thyroid cancer, which may not be thyroid at all, but is supporting tissue and is usually catastrophic in that we really don't have any treatment for it other than palliative surgery. And medullary cancer, which is uh, often inherited and goes along with the with multiple endocrine problems, and also demands a different therapy because it's not re active to uh, radioiodine, but it is, of course, amenable by surgery. So bringing Dr. Bright back in here too. So if we're looking at the first thyroid cancer that we're speaking about, um, and removing the thyroid completely. So if you don't mind, kind of talking through that a little bit, and then also from there, what are the hormone replacement therapies that occur once a thyroid is completely removed? And, and is it normal practice, I think it is, if I understood that right, is it normal practice to remove the entire thyroid if there are, if there's a cancer in the thyroid? Very well, so we already alluded to the fact that there's a lot of nodules, mm -hmm. and some are benign and some are cancerous. Um, Many times the benign ones are amenable to having only one side of the thyroid gland taken out. Um, rarely, even some of the malignant ones may be amenable to one side only. Um, uh, surgically, uh, these days, uh, a lot has changed in the last decade in terms of our ability to operate on people and how long they stay in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I, when I moved to El Paso, this was always inpatient surgery, and those patients were in the hospital for days postoperatively. Um, now the vast majority of my patients go home the same day. Wow. Um, you know, some of the most elderly are not fit to go home maybe for other reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I would say 80 to 90 percent of patients that have a thyroid cancer removed or a benign um, tumor of the thyroid removed go home the same day. Uh, the surgeries uh, ballpark two hours. Um, Goodness, okay. So they, they go under anesthesia. They have one or both sides of the gland removed. If uh, we can throw that graphic back up again, uh, Gracie, in the back. And the reason I'm saying this, and you'll see on this screen in just a moment, uh, the graphic um, the, of the thyroid. And what I'd like to do mm -hmm. is, while we're looking at the graphic, explain to the audience how the thyroid is removed. I mean, we're... It, it, Sure. Where the incision comes in, is the thyroid removed then just as one whole organ? Is it mm -hmm. you know cut up into different pieces? There's just all kinds of different ways that this is done. Sure. So so the surgical incisions they're they're variable and they depend on the severity of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, now, if the disease is completely confined to the thyroid and it's a small lesion, you know, one to three or four centimeters, right? Um, that can usually be removed in what I call a minimally invasive way, uh, using a three to four centimeter incision, which is mm -hmm. just a couple inches, uh, typically in the midline of the neck. Um, that, uh, that, that will allow removal of one side or both sides of the gland okay. and a good sampling of lymph nodes to see if the tumor has spread outside of the gland. Um, uh, that operation is done under general anesthesia. Um, these days we monitor um, a, a number of things during the surgery, including the patient's overall anesthetic state, but uh, more importantly, um, to avoid complications of the thyroid surgery. Um, I, your diagram, I, I couldn't see the, the nerves, but the, the nerve that moves your vocal cords on mm, the other mm -hmm. side lies directly under the thyroid gland. So interoperatively, we continually through the entire surgery monitor ah. that nerves and okay. hopes that it will function as well after surgery as it did before. Um, uh, there's parathyroid glands that are next to the thyroid. Mm -hmm. uh, the body really likes to have one or more of those working after the surgery, and uh, 
Uh, we, we have ways to see those interoperatively now that we didn't have before. And, we and how do you see those, if you don't mind my asking? Is that through, are you, is it an ultrasound? Are you doing the operation while looking through an ultrasound? Or is this physical, cl cl clinically looking at during um, the surgery? So uh, we operate with magnification, mm -hmm. so typically you can just see them. Okay. Um, there are some uh, interesting new devices on the market now that uh, take advantage of the fact that parathyroid glands um, uh, autofluoresce, and so you huh. can shine a light on them that uh, causes them to glow in the dark, basically. Well, and, look at uh, that. You know, if you're having trouble seeing them, it, it makes it a little easier to make sure they're there and working properly when the surgery is uh, completed. Um, so when we do any of these surgeries for cancer or for benign disease, uh, um, typically the same kind of approach, unless it's vastly spread. So sometimes the disease is outside of the thyroid gland and it's cancerous mm. and it's involving the lymph nodes in the right. neck and, and then that becomes a much more involved sort of a surgery with much larger incisions and uh, removal of the lymph nodes of the neck that may or may not contain the, the, the metastatic cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the case when we're doing but surgery for benign disease, which typically only ever stays in the gland. Right. And, and I like the way you describe that, too, because there is benign disease, too, so it's not always cancerous, but there is surgery that is required sometimes with either or. I um, have a question here from the audience, and we were talking about hypothyroidism earlier, but the question is a 65-year-old male who has hypothyroidism and RA, and he's wondering if there is a uh, generic auto, autoimmune component to these, just out of curiosity. Um, and he also wants to know if there's complications down the line in his life. So uh, the assumption is he is being treated. Again, this is a, a male uh, question from the audience. Um, but who'd like to take on that question? So all autoimmune Dr. Bright? diseases track together. Okay. So if you have one, ah. chances are in your lifetime, you're going to get another one. Okay. So people that make these antibodies against their own tissue, then just because they started with the thyroid, they, they might have something else later on. Rheumatoid arthritis is very common. Vitiligo is probably the most common. That's to the pigment in the skin, and you get these little white areas in the skin. Mm -hmm. um, you can have any of the other rheumatologic diseases. Uh, lupus is very common. B12 deficiency, anemia, type 1 diabetes, they're all autoimmune diseases. So any of those can happen during that lifetime. So if you have someone that has any autoimmune disease, we usually screen for the other ones or at least ask symptoms, look for signs nice. of, of those other diseases over time. If they don't have thyroid disease, they should be checked for thyroid disease right. all the time as well. So, so he should obviously be treated for the hypothyroidism, and rheumatoid arthritis has a totally different treatment that he needs for that. But it makes sense that he's got both. But he's got both. Right. And since he has two, each one you get makes you more likely to get the next one. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be watched by, by you know, the physicians looking for those things. Well, it's always nice to know that you can be on lookout. Um, I'm going to go back to our through the ages, and Dr. Streeter, I'm going to bring this one to you. Young adults, we were talking about adolescents, and now if we're looking at young adults, we haven't talked a lot about hyperthyroidism, and I don't think we've brought up, uh, you brought up earlier, Graves' disease, but let's talk about both of those. Um, what is hyperthyroidism? I know that there's too much there, but in association with Graves' disease. Well, hyperthyroidism is indeed the thyroid producing too much metabolic hormone and the body reacting by becoming hyperactive. Mm -hmm. uh, and the typical symptoms of uh, hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease uh, is uh, nervousness, uh, weight loss, uh, anxiety, uh, fast heartbeat, uh, hair loss, uh, all the symptoms one might expect with uh, severe uh, metabolic uh, activity. Mm -hmm. uh, Graves' disease uh, is an autoimmune disease. Uh, it's diagnosed, in fact, by specific uh, antibodies, and uh, it uh, affects not only the thyroid, but can affect other portions of the body, particularly the eyes, the muscles, the tissues around the eyes, and uh, the skin. Uh, there are unusual manifestations of Graves' disease that uh, are seen only once or twice uh, with uh, neurological abnormalities. There's a sort of a dyskinesis, a shakiness. Mm -hmm. uh, the treatment is to uh, reduce the uh, function of the thyroid, mm -hmm. reduce the production of, 
uh, T4. And uh, this is done with pills, with radioactive iodine, uh, and or with surgery. So uh, radioactive iodine, that, that interests me only because I don't know much about it. So how would that be done? Is that uh, done on an external form? Or how, how, how do you treat with interactive iodine? Well, number one, in order to treat with radioactive iodine, certain criteria need to be met. And okay. one of those is that the patient have a relatively low iodine level in, in the body. Ah. And uh, unfortunately, today, with uh, all sorts of uh, over-the-counter thyroid boosters, and metabolic boosters, this vitamin, that vitamin, mm -hmm. it's not at all uncommon to find someone with Graves' disease who we'd like to treat with radioiodine because it's usually a one-time permanent I therapy. See. Okay. Uh, but their serum iodine is 150 or 200, and to give extra radioactive iodine would not be metabolized by the thyroid, therefore the therapy would not work. So you're talking so, about just different uh, vitamins that people are putting into their system, different this, different that, that often there's iodine in these different supplements, so to speak. That's right. And that's the issue? And if someone suspects that they have a thyroid disease, they should avoid the uh, mineral uh, supplement. Interesting. Another okay. thing they should avoid, might as well toss it in now, is biotin. Yes, and let's do talk know, about biotin because I've got that here as well. Yes. Biotin is a uh, pseudo vitamin that is supposed to make uh, the hair grow and the nails strong, and it might. Uh, as far as I know, there's never been a research study that has proven that biotin really does anything. But we do know it does one thing, and that is it interferes with the measurement of TSH. Oh, really? Which is okay. a critical measurement in thyroid disease. So any patient who is taking biotin. Uh, to start with, uh, has uh, abnormal thyroid tests because of the biotin. So if you suspect you have thyroid disease, please don't take biotin. And if you're going to get thyroid tests, please stop your biotin for at least a week before getting the test. And I would add to that, if you're getting any lab tests, stop the biotin. So biotin is a reagent in the machine that does these multiple tests that we run. And it isn't just the TSH that's a problem. It's cardiac tests, it's the PSA for prostate, oh. it's the PTH for the uh, parathyroid disease. There's about 15 different tests that it interferes with. So if you're taking biotin, you need any blood work done, just stop it. And as Dr. Strader says, a week ahead of time would be great. That's long enough to get it out of the system, and then you can restart it. It's not that the biotin is doing anything to the thyroid per se or anything to you, and as he said, it, it may do something for your hair and nails. It, it isn't going to hurt you otherwise, but the problem is it, it causes a problem with the lab tests. And mm. then if you're taking thyroid hormone or you weren't taking thyroid hormone, suddenly you have an abnormal thyroid test and people start your thyroid hormone when right. they didn't need it or change the dose of your thyroid hormone if you're already on it or think that you have a prostate problem because your PSA is elevated, or think you're having a cardiac issue because it causes troponin problems, which is the lab test we get for having a heart attack. So it becomes a big issue for the lab. And that's, I did not know that. And biotin, it's, I feel like you hear that every other commercial, it's in every other. everything. Yes. And they are now putting it in your coconut water and your uh, vitamin water. My goodness. So yes. you may not even know that you're getting biotin. So read the labels. It's in your multivitamins, it's B7 in the B vitamins, it's uh, mm. in all the hair and nail supplements, so you really need to look and see what you know, it Dr. is. Dr. Bright, I'm going to go home and look at all my stuff now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Taking all these supplements because you just want to be good and healthy, so it's always nice to, to have something, uh, not necessarily as a red flag, maybe a, a, a pink flag. Um, I want to talk about, because I know we're, we're getting pretty far into the program, I want to talk about thyroid disease and thyroid, specifically thyroid eye disease. Um, and I know sometimes with Graves' disease, this is something that, that comes about as well. Is it one and the same? Are they two different things? And whoever would like to take that on? So Dr. thyroid Breyer? eye disease is Graves' disease. So mm -hmm. when you have Graves' disease... So they're interchangeable the way... Um, not all part. Graves' disease has thyroid eye disease. I see. So, okay. But the only time you get thyroid eye disease is if you have Graves the Graves' disease. antibody. So the same okay. antibodies that cause Graves' disease um, interact with a protein in the back of the eye. 
and then that causes a lot of inflammation and then you get uh, just edema that causes the eye to push forward. So you have your eyes pushed out mm -hmm. and if they're out far enough, you can actually end up with double vision. You have problems with the muscles of the eye, moving the eye back and forth. You can get a lot of inflammation and swelling around the eye. Um, and for years, we treated it with steroids, which was about all that we had, but it wasn't particularly a, a great therapy for everyone. Uh, we do have another medication now, which is relatively new, which is a monoclonal antibody mm -hmm. called Tepeza um, that is infused over the course of uh, about six months. And it does work very, very well. So if people so have over the eye six disease. months, and then you do not have to have treatment after that, or is it really so six months and it's not a lifelong treatment? Mm -mm. How nice is that? Yep. So I'm a Synthroid girl. That's going to be for the rest of my life, and yep. uh, I know a lot of people are on Synthroid. I feel like I'd like to get that uh, in a moment too. I have another question here from the audience. Uh, there's a 53 year old female on the line had her thyroid removed after uh, papillary thyroid cancer. She's now wondering if there are other concerns that uh, commonly occur with uh, thyroid cancer, because you were talking about you know, just different things. Sorry, just jumped over here for me. We have another question. Uh, is she at higher risk for getting other cancers is her question. As Dr. Strader? Fact, as a matter of fact, she is. Okay. Uh, people with autoimmune disease, in fact, are at risk for getting some cancers. It seems that breast cancers, lymphomas particularly, are uh, increased in patients with autoimmune disease. And this includes patients who have Graves' disease, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yes, she is at risk. Uh, she is also at risk for developing uh, changes as she ages mm -hmm. in her need for uh, thyroid hormone. Usually mm -hmm. the need goes up. Right. Uh, so. Uh, and of course, the parathyroids hopefully were spared in her surgery, mm -hmm. so she doesn't have to worry about parathyroid hormone. Uh, and if someone has a thyroid removed and does not take replacement hormone, thyroid hormone, what what are the dangers there? The like, danger there is uh, if they are thyroids removed, you become hypothyroid. Okay. Uh, the T1 half for thyroid is pretty long, as Tamis mentioned probably 10 days or so. Mm -hmm. So within six or eight weeks, you have no thyroid hormone. Obviously, you're going to be sick in hypothyroid, myxodiminous, we call it. Myxodiminous, yes, nice that, word. That's the, the worst form of hypothyroidism. And it has about a 10% rate of mortality. Okay. So, so it isn't something you want to just not take your thyroid hormone. So mm -hmm. it isn't something that happens immediately. It's you, you miss a dose, you don't need to worry. But if you stop taking it for you know, usually a few months, then eventually those levels get low enough that you get more and more symptoms mm -hmm. and uh, you get cardiac dysfunction. Uh, right. And eventually you can die from that. So we, you definitely need to take your thyroid hormone lifelong if you have no thyroid. Okay. Yes, Dr. Bright? I just wanted to backtrack to the Graves disease because yes. there's a surgical role there as well. So when we see a fair number of people that uh, just are not responding to medical management of their Graves disease and they're, they're either shooting up or too low with their thyroid functions and uh, they're difficult to manage. And in those circumstances, we're not taking out a nodule or a cancer, right. but we'll take out the thyroid gland to control the the Graves' disease, um, not, not very common because the medication options are typically pretty good. Um, and then there's also a surgical role for management of the eye disease. Mm. Um, we discussed how expensive earlier tonight the, the, the new drug is, and for, for many, many years, the answer to keep the corneas from opacifying and having patients end up with horrible vision problems has been to decompress <coughs> the orbits, which is one of the things that we do surgically. Uh, it's a sort of an advanced You decompress the surgery. orbits of the eyeball itself? So we remove the bony walls of the orbit so that the eyeballs can slide back into the head and okay. so that the eyelids can close. People with this Graves eye disease, they can't close their eyelids and the corneas dry out and opacify and hurt fairly right. horribly. How fascinating. Dr. Strader, you, you had something to add? Another role for yes. surgery in Graves disease mm -hmm. is often a Graves disease, an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm has thyroid nodules, and thyroid nodules in Graves' disease are more likely to be cancerous 
in, okay. in other forms of thyroid problem. So uh, if a patient has Graves' disease and has a large nodule, uh, frequently we'll send them to surgery as first th uh, therapy rather than even trying mm -hmm. radioiodine or pills. Mm -hmm. And if they have bad eye disease and you take the thyroid out, you remove the target for those antibodies, decrease the antibodies, and sometimes that does help the, uh, the eye disease as well. What a domino effect mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, I'm getting another question here from the audience, but I want to talk about Hashimoto's disease uh, just because that is commonly talked about, and I'm just throwing that to whoever wants to take it. That's just the hypothyroid we've been That's talking just so about. The, and so Hashimoto's, that goes, okay. So we've got that going. Yeah, actually, um, hypothyroidism can be caused by a variety of thyroiditis, the most common being Hashimoto's. I see. And okay. Hashimoto's thyroiditis has an antibody we can measure to tell people you have Hashimoto's. But you can also have a big, lumpy, bumpy goiter with thyroiditis that is unclassified, and it's probably close to so hypothyroid means just, hypothyroid it's is just low a bad for whatever gland. reason. Hashimoto's it's just a bad is the gland. antibodies made it low. I see. Okay, um, I, I'm going to go here to involuntary thyroid because I've got I've got a lot of things. There's a lot of people interested in this program, so I'm glad you guys are here. Um, Involun, is that right? No. Mm -mm. Involutional? Involutional, yes. Let's talk about in, involutional thyroid. Um, scarred gland is failing. So in other words, this is part of the, the prep material I have before this. Let's talk about what well, that is. Uh, that was in uh, reference to what happens when people get ultrasounds and all I of a sudden see. they find a, a small scarred thyroid. In all probability, it's the end result of a thyroiditis. Uh, it could be the end result of multiple subacute thyroiditis, which is a, an acute viral disease that harms the thyroid. Or it could be the result of taking thyroid medicine for years and years and years mm -hmm. and gradually getting uh, what's known thyroid. as the thyroid that goes to sleep. And it becomes a small, nodular, lumpy, bumpy thyroid. And does this thyroid wake back up or is it asleep forever? Usually not. Okay. Usually by the time... It uh, has involutional characteristics. It's not, not going to come back, so therapy is, is indicated. And that therapy is Synthroid right. or thyroid hormone. Uh, we usually like to get the TSH up to almost one mm -hmm. and uh, keep it there. So as with age, with hypothyroidism, as with age, again, every year, I know I get my blood tested every year, and every two or three years I go up in whatever my dosage is. Why is that when we're talking about ageism, when we're talking about pregnancy and then the little ones and then into lower adulthood, what is it that causes the thyroid to produce even less and less as you get older? And Dr. Well, Straight Arlette, Actually, yeah. if you're taking your thyroid and your TSH is in the, in the normal low range, let's say, uh -huh. uh, there's not too much reason your dose should increase other than your ability to absorb the dose. There's a good question right there. And, that, that's great. Let's talk about that for a minute. And most people, adults, mm -hmm. need between 100 and 150 micrograms of thyroid medicine mm -hmm. to supply enough hormone for normal metabolism. That's okay. just the rule of thumb. Uh, with uh, gastritis, with gastric bypass, with uh, unusual diets, vegan diets or unusual diets, mm -hmm. let's just say, uh, the ability to absorb that medicine becomes altered and you may need changes. Okay. And people uh, have to remember you have to take thyroid hormone fasting or it will not absorb. And they really mean fasting, not with your coffee, not with other medications, just the thyroid with water, nothing else, and wait at least 30 minutes and preferably 60 minutes before you eat or take any other medicine. or. If you, it, you know, sometimes you take it with food, you take it with your coffee, you don't, then your levels are going to be everywhere. All over the place. So it, the way my doctor described to me years ago, in the morning you wake up, you've got your water there, you take your little pill, you drink your water and go about your business. And by then, showered and all that good stuff, it would be a half an hour later. 
Um, so that's just how I remembered it from way back when. Can I go back yes. to nodules for just a yes, sec? Yes, actually, this is perfect because we're about 10 minutes out. So right now, I'd like to really get to the things that we haven't talked about yet that we want to get out there. I just We talked a lot about thyroid cancer. I just want people to realize that the majority of nodules are benign. Yes. So 90% of nodules are benign. So you know, people are now suddenly thinking, oh, my God, I have to go get my thyroid taken care of because I'm going to die of cancer or something. So, But uh, it's good to get it checked. So yes. if there's anything the show will provide, you should get it checked. Always, the doctor should be checking your thyroid. And, and unfortunately, frequently, uh, people are busy in clinic with many, many other medical problems, and the thyroid doesn't get checked. Mm. So the thyroid should be checked. Uh, and then if you do have a nodule, we don't have to biopsy all of them. If they're, if they're small nodules, they're less than a centimeter, uh, assuming you don't have some other risk, you know, you, if you had a family history of thyroid cancer, you already had radiation to the head and neck, then those we might think a little bit harder right. about. But the, the ones that are less than a centimeter, people have cysts in the thyroid. A simple cyst in the thyroid is never a problem. It's a solid lesion that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And before anybody gets a biopsy, they need a thyroid level done. Because if you are hyperthyroid, frequently those nodules are just overactive nodules. And an overactive nodule is never cancer. And we don't want to biopsy overactive nodules because it becomes an issue for the pathologist when they're looking at the biopsy to tell whether that's an overactive nodule or whether it's a thyroid cancer. And we know just from epidemiology that nodules that make thyroid hormone are very rarely thyroid cancer. And are these nodules that would be removed surgically or would they stay in there and undergo surveillance for a lifetime? If it's a hyperthyroid nodule, then you treat the hyperthyroidism. Okay. So you don't, and that would be, again, meds or radioactive iodine. Uh, if it's a, a patient that's hypo, you would treat the hypothyroidism, and sometimes those nodules will just go away when you treat the hypothyroidism. If it's a benign nodule, whether you biopsied it or it was so small you didn't need a biopsy, then you just watch it with an ultrasound. Okay. Might Dr. Strader? Here too, that, mm -hmm. uh, probably half the nodules we see in our clinic are diagnosed uh, serendipitously. Ah. Someone uh, gets mm -hmm. a free ultrasound at the uh, church bake sale, right. and uh, sure enough, there's a thyroid nodule. Uh -huh. Or they get a CAT scan of their chest, and uh, it sees uh, two little cysts and a nodule. Right. Often right. these are described by the radiologist as two or three millimeter size, so quote, mm -hmm. lesions. Mm -hmm. These are things we would not biopsy and not really worry about mm -hmm. unless there was specific family history. And that's where a blood test, a THS test would come in and you would see if there is something functioning that shouldn't be. Well, a uh, thyroid function test tell us the metabolic status. They really don't tell us a lot about the nodules other than that they might be hyperactive nodules, autonomous hyperactive nodules. Okay. My point is don't run out and get a lot of thyroid tests and have somebody biopsy the nodules before you see a physician and let him decide whether or not it's Something important to, to do. I mean, right. we don't get every mole taken off as far as I know. I know we don't get all I've of had our plenty. age spots. I've had removed. plenty taken off, but no, I get it. Uh, yes, Dr. Bright? There's a couple of things I think are interesting in the last decade when it comes to evaluating these nodules. One is that um, I think our radiology colleagues and the endocrinologists and head and neck surgeons that are doing ultrasounds have come up with some pretty good criteria by ultrasound to, de to determine which of the nodules are suspicious based mm -hmm. on the appearance on ultrasound. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's been tremendously um, helpful in terms of saying, no, this one doesn't look suspicious, let's just watch it and repeat the ultrasound. The other thing that's really been interesting and helpful, I think, is that when the nodules are suspicious and they do undergo a needle biopsy, mm -hmm. um, we used to have some conundrums that involve, well, this kind of looks suspicious when you do the biopsy. Now we have the, the medical ability in those cases to look at the genetics of those cells and determine what the risk factor for that biopsy actually representing a cancer, which is something that, you know, even 10 years ago we didn't have that oh, option at all and has really probably decrease the number of people that end up getting thyroid surgery because we feel more comfortable watching it knowing that the genetics don't really go along with uh, a malignancy. What a blessing time in research years. And if they don't have mutations, then it's much less likely to be a thyroid cancer. Okay. 
And so we're talking about a lot of benign issues. We have a whopping four minutes left. So Dr. Strader, if there's anything that we have not covered yet that you want to get out there, is there anything that, that, mm. that should be? Yes? We might mention one thing that scares the living crickets out of people is to have sudden pain and swelling in their neck. And that's usually a hemorrhagic cyst in the thyroid. Ah. The treatment for that is to aspirate the blood and let it get well. And most of the time they do. Sometimes a hemorrhagic cyst will turn into a simple cyst, and mm -hmm. sometimes a simple cyst will get great big. Again, if it's cosmetically important to the patient, it can be aspirated. However, in my experience, they, quote, always come back. Mm. And eventually, if it's a big enough problem for the patient, they need to see Kevin have it removed. And have it just completely removed. Makes sense. There are therapies where you inject things to sclerose it, I don't think those are appropriate okay. cells. Dr. Breiter, anything that we want to touch base on? The only thing I'd like to mention is natural thyroid hormones. So I was we, going to talk about medications. When Perfect. people need to take thyroid hormone, we recommend they actually take brand thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else, please get generic. It's cheaper. Thyroid hormone, the brand actually has better quality control, and when we're trying to get people's level very, you know, tightly controlled so they feel well, when they're getting generic medicines, they batch to batch, they're different, and the, the stores, when they get the batch, it's from a totally different company than the last batch you got. Right. So it, it is difficult. If you are getting generic, then have them fill it with the same generic company each time. Now, there are natural thyroid hormones out there. Now, they're made from animal thyroid. That is not natural to take pig hormone. Mm -hmm. And animals have way more of the T3 type of hormone in it than we make. So, when so you beware take of the them, word natural. I don't mean to cut yeah. you off, but we're running a little bit out of town. But beware of the word uh, uh, natural. So if you, um, Synthroid is one. What is the other brand name? That there are, are several. Levoxyl, Euthroid. Okay. There's many. Just names. just make it a brand. Okay. And if you're a young and woman continue and you're with that specific brand getting, is what you're saying. Yeah. Getting pregnant mm -hmm. and you're taking natural thyroid hormone, the T3 does not cross the placenta. So we're talking about how important it is for that baby to have thyroid hormone. That kid is not getting any thyroid hormone. Okay. And so OBGYN, definitely talk about that. So we have a whole minute to go. I want to say thank you very much again to uh, Dr. Tamas Bright. Thank you very much to Dr. Kevin Bright. Thank you very much. And Dr. Wilbur Strader, all three of you um, are the ones that put together this show and underwrote this show this evening. And so I thank you for being around for 25 years, at least, to the El Paso County Medical Society. Um, we have been talking this evening about thyroid disease and thyroid cancer. You'll be able to watch this show again on PBS elpaso.org and that will be posted within about a day. You can also watch a show again on the El Paso County Medical Society's website and that is EPCMS, just think of the acronym, dot com and you can go through and watch that. So uh, again, El Paso County Medical Society has been doing the show and we have uh, Dr. McCollum who is leaving presidency and Dr. Jeff Spear who's coming into the presidency uh, this coming Groundhog Day on February 2nd. So that should be a lot of fun. I'm Katherine Berg and you've been watching The El Paso Physician.